Grand Theft Auto V launched in 2013, it made a billion dollars in its first three days. That's more than the top 23 movies in the history of cinema have accomplished in their entire lifetime. In three days. When it comes to financials, games can more than match the very best that Hollywood has to offer. But how well do games match up when it comes to emotional engagement? Can games touch us in the way that a movie can? Can games deliver the same power of telling a story? Steven Spielberg was of the opinion that this parity would only be possible when somebody played a game and said they cried at level 17. I think this was a throwaway remark. I think this was an off-the-cuff thing that was said and which perhaps 25 years ago wouldn't have even been remembered uh, in 10 minutes' time. But of course, this is the, the internet age and we don't forget anything. So this quote is remembered and it resurfaces every now and again. Uh, we, we hear it and it becomes a point of discussion for people who are interested in narrative and in developing game narrative. And it's an interesting litmus test. The first game that I ever worked on uh, was with a company called Rare, and it was a game called Donkey Kong Country. Now, I don't think a huge number of people cried <laughs> when Donkey Kong had his banana stolen, or indeed at level 17. Um, and perhaps when we look at Donkey Kong Country, we think to ourselves, how can games possibly compare to movies such as Citizen Kane or Schindler's List or Shawshank Redemption? Well, tonight I'd like to propose that not only can games be as effective a medium for storytelling as movies, but they can be so much more. They're a medium which can deliver narrative in new and engaging ways. There are a medium in which we can be immersed more deeply than has ever been possible. And there are a medium which has the potential to be the most powerful storytelling medium of the 21st century. But first, I'd like to talk about something which games traditionally have been really bad at. In movies, we typically empathize with the main character. We root for them. We share their highs, we share their lows. It's the emotional connection that we have. In Shawshank Redemption, and I've got to apologize here for spoilers, but frankly, if you've not seen Shawshank Redemption by now, then, then you've only got yourselves to blame. Um, in Shawshank Redemption, we empathize with Andy. We're with Andy. We're with Andy in brutality when he's raped and beaten by Boggs and his gang. We're with Andy in despair when his one chance at establishing his innocence and giving him freedom is cruelly ripped from him by the prison governor. And we're with Andy in elation when he escapes, when he's standing there in the pouring rain and his arms are outstretched. And he's not just escaped, but he's managed to pay back everybody who wronged him in the process. We're with Andy. It's no surprise that one and a half million people have ranked the Shawshank Redemption as the best movie on IMDb, because it's a masterclass in emotional engagement. By the time Andy escapes, it feels like we've escaped Shawshank Penitentiary with him. So what about Donkey Kong Country? Was I sad? Did I shed a few tears when Donkey Kong's bananas were cruelly taken from him? Was I elated when he managed to win them back again? Did I feel anything? In short, I would say no. Because I don't empathize with Donkey Kong. He's my avatar. He's my representation on the screen. He's my way of interacting with the game world. Now, you may think to yourself, Oliver, is it really fair to compare Shawshank Redemption and Donkey Kong Country? How can we possibly measure up one man's freedom against the infinitely worse crime of stealing the monkey's bananas. Um, but regardless, even when we have more realistic characters, even when we have more sophisticated characters, the same problem remains, because games are interactive. Games are all about our actions. In games, we have direct emotions. I like to call them visceral emotions. 
There are emotions which are derived from the way we interact with the game world and the experiences we have. We can feel curiosity when we encounter something new and interesting in the game. We can feel wary when we encounter something that perhaps we're, we're, we're a bit worried about. We can even feel relaxed. If you've ever played Tetris and got in the zone, then the rest of the world just fades away. But the emotion that perhaps has become most intimately linked with video games is that of frustration. Frustration is the emotional response we have to opposition. It's when we're opposed in our goals. And frustration is something which countless games, from Pong to Portal, from Galaxians to Grand Theft Auto, have utilized to craft exciting, enjoyable experiences. Frustration is addictive. It makes us want more and more and more. Anybody who in the last couple of years played Flappy Bird will know what I'm talking about. But the great thing about frustration is it has this payoff. It has this emotional response when we overcome it, when we triumph against adversity. It's the feeling we get when we want to slide down the touchline after scoring a goal, or when we want to pump our fist after hitting a winning shot in tennis. It's the release of tension and frustration. And the greater the level of frustration, well, the more powerful that release. And games, well, games have got this fantastic palette of emotions to play with that games, that games can do things which movies can't really evoke. Games, we're physically part of the action. We're immersed. We're feeling visceral emotions. And it's one of the reasons why I believe that more storytellers should be experimenting with games, should be attempting to see what this medium can deliver. But games don't just have that palette. They can also rely upon the palette of emotions, perhaps we could call them passive emotions, that we more traditionally see in movies. Now, perhaps uh, when we look at movies, when we, when we uh, look at movies compared to games, perhaps we think, well, I don't associate with the main character in a game at all. I, he's my avatar, so I don't have the same connection with the main character that I have with the main character of a movie. But I can have connections with the non-player characters. I can make connections to my companions and to my comrades. I can make connections to the characters that are around me in the game world. And these connections, they can be really powerful. Back when I was at Rare, I played a Japanese role-play game called Chrono Trigger. Now, Chrono Trigger had a character in it, uh, a robot, which I originally uh, named Robot. This was back in the Super Nintendo era, so this was before polygons. This was back when it was all pixels, and all pixels are all we had. And frankly, we didn't even have very many of those because uh, Robot was about 32 by 24 pixels. He was a tiny little blob on the screen, but despite that, Robot became an important part of my team. And when there came a point in the story that Robot was brutally beaten and seemingly destroyed, I felt sorry for that little dude. I felt bad for him. You know, I felt an emotional response. Uh, I felt sad. I felt frustrated and angry for the, against the robots that did it, and I empathized. I empathized with him just like I perhaps empathized with Andy. Now, I think the best way that this works within games, this type of emotion, is when we steal a little bit of interactivity from the player when we make them passive by forcing them to be powerless. We increase the attention, we increase the stakes, we put them in a position where they can't really do anything. And, and because of that, uh, because of being helpless, we're forced to sit and watch. So I felt so sorry for poor little robot because I had to sit and watch as this happened to him. I couldn't interfere, I couldn't stop the robots from doing it, all I could do was empathize. So games, games have got this remarkably different two palettes they can play with the passive and the visceral. And if you combine those deftly, if you blend them well, then you can make this remarkable experience. So games, yes, you know, they can more than match movies when it comes to financials, but in the 21st century, they're going to more than match them when it comes to emotional engagement as well. If you want to cry at level 17, then you'll find a game that can do that. 
If you want to experience the joy of curious exploration, then you can find that as well. And if you want to experience that triumph over adversity, then you will find that. And the great thing, the thing that makes games the potential to be the most powerful storytelling medium of the 21st century, is maybe, just maybe, you'll find all of those in just one game. Thank you very much.